So um, this non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, it depends upon the light microscopy morphology, and then it depends upon the CD markers morphology, genetic, and then the chromosomal abnormalities. So uh, according to that, uh, it will show the clinical features, and then it will also respond to the treatment, and then it will give the uh, good, or whether it is good or the bad prognosis. Understood here? So non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, I'll repeat the slide once again. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, it depends upon the light microscopy morphology. Morphology means, so we can see the um, slides, uh, and then we can see the cell morphology, individual cell morphology, and how it looks. And then we can also do the CD marker. So whether it, it is a B cell lymphoma or the T cell lymphoma or what type of lymphoma, we can do the CD markers. And we can also do the genetic and then the chromosomal abnormalities and the clinical features also. So clinical features, including the response to the treatment and prognosis also depends upon all these things. So now we'll go to the classification. So the WHO classification. So uh, WHO classification here, it is based on the four categories. So first one is the precursor B cell neoplasm. So precursor B cell means, so we will see the immature precursor cell. So that's why here in the bracket, it is written the immature B cell, precursor B cell neoplasm. And here it is written, written immature B cell. And then the second one is the peripheral B cell neoplasm. That is the mature B cell. So peripheral means one is the precursor B cell neoplasm and another one is the peripheral B cell neoplasm. Here comes in the peripheral B cell neoplasm, the mature B cells we will see. And definitely after the B cells, T cell neoplasm will also come. So here the precursor T cell neoplasm, here under comes the immature T cells. Understood here? One is the precursor B cell neoplasm, another one is the precursor T cell neoplasm. Under the precursor one, we will see the immature B cells, and then the peripheral T cell, and then the NK cell, or the natural killer cell neoplasm. So whenever the word peripheral comes, then we will see the mature cells, and whenever the precursor comes, we will see the immature cells. So broad categories, precursor B cell neoplasm, immature B cell, and peripheral B cell neoplasm, that is the mature B cell, precursor T cell neoplasm, that is the immature T cell, and peripheral T cell and then the NK cell neoplasm. These are the mature T cell and then the NK cell neoplasm. So you just have to remember uh, all these. So now we'll come under the first classification, precursor B cell neoplasm. So under the precursor B cell neoplasm, we will see the precursor B lymphoblastic leukemia slash lymphoma. So here the immature cells, We by this time you must be knowing uh, these are the blast cells, isn't it? So, so here the classification is also precursor B lymphoblastic leukemia or lymphoma. So that if it is in the blood, then we call it leukemia. And whenever it is there in the tissues, like in the lymphoreticular organs, like in case of the lymph nodes or in the spleen, we call it lymphoma. So now we'll come to the peripheral B cell. So peripheral B cell neoplasm here. There are the different types are there. Chronic lymphocytic leukemia or the small lymphocytic lymph lymphoma is there. So here we will see the mature cells, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Whenever it is there in the blood, we call it leukemia. And whenever it is there in the tissues, we call it lymphoma. So others are also there. B cell pro-lymphocytic leukemia. So here uh, it's a little bit uh, maturing cell. So here the B cell pro-lymphocytic leukemia is there. And then the lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma. So lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, so the names here, the, these lymphocytes look like somewhat like plasma cell. Lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma and the splenic or the nodal marginal zone lymphoma. So whenever uh, Sar was teaching you the lymph node, uh, by this time you must have seen what is the marginal zone, isn't it? So, so here the splenic or the nodal marginal zone lymphoma is there. Extra nodal marginal zone lymphoma is there. And mantle cell lymphoma is also there. So all these, uh, you just have to know the uh, name only. So you don't have to know the detail. And then the follicular cell lymphoma. So it is important. So follicular cell lymphoma must have been taught to you. And then the marginal zone lymphoma is there. And then the diffuse large B cell lymphoma is there. And then the Burkitt lymphoma. So yesterday, Sar was telling me that he finished the Burkitt lymphoma. So here, mainly... Uh, the important names like chronic lymphocytic leukemia, small lymphocytic slash, small lymphocytic lymphoma, 
follicular cell lymphoma, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Here the cells are very large and then it will show the prominent nuclei, diffuse large B cell lymphoma and then another one is a Burkitt lymphoma. So now we'll go to the precursor T cell, okay? Now we'll come to the precursor T cell neo neoplasm. So here the cells will be of the, it will not be the B lymphocytes, but it will be the T lymphocytes, isn't it? So, so as the name tells here, the precursor T cell neoplasms, it is the precursor T lymphoblastic leukemia slash lymphoma. So it's easy to remember also precursor T lymphoblastic leukemia slash lymphoma. So now we'll come to the peripheral T cell neoplasm. So peripheral T cell neoplasm or the natural killer cell neoplasm, NK cell neoplasm. So here the T cell pro-lymphocytic leukemia is there. And then the large granular lymphocytic leukemia is there. And then the mycosis fungoides or the Cesare syndrome is there. So here these names uh, you have to know only, uh, but I, can, I cannot explain in detail of all these cells. So here you just have to remember the peripheral T cell or the natural killer or NK cell neoplasm. So here the mature T cells or the NK cells will be there. And some T cells will be like pro-lymphocytic leukemia and some cells will be large granular so it will show the in the cytoplasm granular so it is a large granular lymphocytic leukemia and mycosis fungoides uh, you have to know this name because this lymphoma it up uh, it will involve the skin so uh, we taught you uh, in the previous classes that this lymphoma it will be there in the uh, this reticular uh, lymphoid tissues, that is the spleen and then the lymph node and also in other organs also like in the lung, GIT also is it. But this mycosis fungoides or the Cesare syndrome here, the patient will present with the skin neoplasm, that is the lymphoma in the skin. And then the peripheral T cell lymphoma, that is the unspecified is there and anaplastic large cell lymphoma, here the cells will look very anaplastic and angioimmunoblastic T cell lymphoma is there. You just have to know the name, but a little bit uh, I'll make you easy for you to remember angioimmunoblastic so here mainly uh, in the germinal center of the lymph node we will see the uh, immunoblast so here the blood vessels together with the immunoblast will be there so angioimmunoblastic t cell lymphoma is there and enteropathy associated t lymphoma so enteropathy associated means that it is the intestine associated isn't it so so here that's why here the enteropathy associated t cell lymphoma is there and paniculitis like T cell lymphoma. Paniculitis like means, so here, uh, paniculitis means it is the inflammation of the fat cells or the adipose tissue that is known as the paniculitis. So here it will, it name is like paniculitis like T cell lymphoma and hepatosplenic, uh, this T cell lymphoma is there. Gamma delta, this uh, T cell lymphoma is there and adult T cell leukemia slash lymphoma is there and natural killer or the T slash T cell lymphoma and then NK cell lymphoma is there. So um, you try to remember this WHO classification is very dif um, difficult also. Names are also difficult, but if you remember few, then that is also fine. So now your uh, classif WHO classification of non-Hoskins lymphoma is finished. So now here, uh, WHO classification, there were the pre precursor B cell neoplasm, peripheral B cell neoplasm, precursor T cell neoplasm, peripheral T cell neoplasm. So I told you all these classifications. So now your WHO classification and lymphoma is finished. Now we will go to the, uh, uh, this, uh, what do you say? We'll go to the spleen. Okay, so. Are you hearing me? Can you raise your hand, some of you? Okay, okay, thank you. Today my this speaker didn't work and then it's giving trouble to me. So now we'll go to the spleen. So now, 
your this leukemia lymphoma class is finishing so no, today we'll talk about the spleen okay so here now first we have to know the little bit about this how it looks and how it measures isn't it so so normally the spleen will weigh or its weight will be 150 g so the spleen weighs 150 g and this spleen measures 12 cm in length and 7 cm in width and then it is 3 cm in thickness so in anatomy uh, you must have uh, seen the spleen and you must have felt how it is isn't it so so the normal weight is 150 g and it measures 12 cm in length and its uh, width or the breadth is 7 cm and its thickness is 3 cm so now we'll come to the splenomegaly what do you mean by splenomegaly so if mike would have walked then i would have said asked you but today i'll not asking i'll be talking myself only so splenomegaly means whenever the spleen is enlarged that time uh, more than it's 12 cm 7 and then the 3 cm this uh, 12 7 3 cm so whenever the spleen enlarges more than this size that time we call it the splenomegaly so splenomegaly means enlargement of the spleen now so splenomegaly will go so it is enlargement of the spleen whenever the spleen enlarges so it gives some diagnostic clue so it is important for the uh, diagnostic clue because some diseases may lead to the enlargement of the spleen suppose in case of the leukemia also the spleen may be enlarged in case of the venous congestion also the spleen may be enlarged and in sometimes occasionally in case of the metastasis also or the lymphoma also the spleen may be enlarged so it is it will give the important diagnostic clue and sometimes it may the splenomegaly may cause the problems so the problems or the whenever the spleen enlarges it uh, will cause the dragging sensation to the people so uh, problem means dragging sensation to the people you know the meaning of dragging sensation so if you are walking and somebody pulls you from behind then like that is known as a dragging sensation isn't it so somewhat like forcefully doing so spleen is in the left hypochondrium isn't it so so spleen is in the left hypochondrium and then whenever it enlarges the spleen will go in a diagonal fashion it will go to the right iliac fossa understood here so it is going towards the it is enlarging in such a manner that it will go in a diagonal fashion like it is, it, from the left uh, hypochondrium it will go to the right iliac fossa that's why uh, it will uh, have the sensation like somebody is pulling or somebody is um, forcing like that so dragging sensation is there and then there will be the discomfort after eating so discomfort after eating means so whenever somebody takes spleen is enlarged and it has become big then it will occupy the space so if somebody is the patient will feel the discomfort and then it can also lead to the hypersplenism hypersplenism means splenomegaly and hypersplenism is different so splenomegaly means uh, the spleen is only enlarged but in case of the hypersplenism so there will be the splenomegaly but this enlarged spleen or the this splenomegaly will destroy the rbcs wbcs and then the platelets so it will lead to the cytopenia understood here and so for this to correct this hypersplenism we have to do the uh, we have to remove the spleen and that is the splenectomy corrects this problem so hypersplenism is characterized by the splenomegaly so all the time splenomegaly will not be the will not lead to the hypersplenism so enlargement of the spleen is known as splenomegaly but the whenever this enlarged spleen it will destroy all these blood cells or the hematopoietic cells that is the rbc wbc and then the platelets that is that time it is known as the hypersplenism and to correct this cytopenia so whenever rbc wbcs and platelets are destroyed then it will lead to the hemoglobin also low wbc also low platelet also low isn't it so so for the correction of that we have to do the splenectomy so splenectomy corrects this problem so now hypersplenism is said to be present when enlarged too readily means very fastly the same which i have already described to you hypersplenism is said to be present when an enlarged spleen destroys the formed elements of the blood readily so it will destroy the blo uh, blood cells and so here the cause um, causes <clears throat> most worthy of remembering are for the hypersplenism so cirrhosis whenever the spleen 
uh, in case of the cirrhosis what happens now the there will be the venous congestion will be there and then it will lead to the um, splenomegaly whenever the blood uh, congestion will be there then the there will be the more and no more venous congestion will be there in the spleen isn't it so so that time also there can be the hypersplenism and in case of the rheumatoid arthritis also and in case of the gaucher's disease also the only proof that hypersplenism was a problem is that the blood counts get better when the spleen is removed so now uh, we can uh, whenever in case of the hypersplenism we will remove the spleen then only this blood counts will come to its normal level understood this one so now we'll go to the causes of splenomegaly so there are the different causes are there bacterial all these uh, infectious causes are there so now here the uh, now we'll come to the causes of splenomegaly so malaria so in case of the malaria also the liver can also be enlarged sometimes and then the sp malaria uh, spleen will be highly enlarged so huge spleen will be there and in case of the infectious mononucleosis bacterial endocarditis leishmaniasis and the tuberculosis so all these infections will lead to the splenomegaly and in case of the congestion also cirrhosis of liver whenever with the lead to the enlargement of the spleen and in case of the right sided cardiac failure now the right side of the heart cannot pump the blood so the inferior vena cava cannot drain the blood isn't it so so now it will lead to the congestion in the liver and then it will lead to the spleen so and also in case of the portal and then the splenic vein thrombosis so in case of the portal and then the splenic vein thrombosis also it will lead to the splenomegaly and sometimes in case of the diseases of white cells or in case of the leukemia so chronic myeloid leukemia okay in case of the chronic myeloid leukemia the patient will have the very huge spleen and then whenever we suspect chronic myeloid leukemia we usually palpate the spleen and we will, or we will see the ultrasonography uh, how it reports so there will be the huge spleen will be there and also in case of the lymphomas so now here you see another point for the splenomegaly splenic vein over over destruction of the blood cells so now whenever the spleen causes the over uh, destruction or the it will destroy the rbcs or, or the other cells that time also it will lead to the splenomegaly so here in case of the hereditary spherocytosis the spherocytes cannot change its shape that's why it will lead to the splenomegaly and in case of the sickle cell anemia and then the thalassemia isn't it so here the this rbcs will not be the normal one isn't it so so here also it will lead to the splenomegaly and in case of the immune hemolytic anemia immune hemolytic anemia the rbcs will be coated with the this uh, antibodies so it will be destroyed in the spleen leading to the splenomegaly so the storage disease in case of the storage disease so the huge spleen will be there and the two names only you have to know gaucher's disease and then the nimen pix disease okay so storage disease gaucher's disease and then the nimen pix disease is there and then the immunologic or the inflammatory condition so sometimes in the inflammatory or the immunologic conditions we can also see the splenomegaly those are the lupus means the lupus systemic lupus erythematosus isn't it so rheumatoid arthritis and in case of the graft rejection also we will see the splenomegaly so now the other causes of the splenomegaly amyloidosis so whenever the amyloid protein is deposited in the spleen that time also it causes the um, uh, splenomegaly and in case of the primary neoplasm or the cyst whenever the primary neoplasm lymphoma is there or uh, this in case of the cml also primary means not cml sorry in case of the lymphoma also the spleen will be enlarged and sometimes whenever the cyst is pre present in the spleen that time also the spleen will be enlarged and in case of the secondary neoplasm secondary neoplasm means whenever the cml is there that time also uh, the spleen enlarges and then whenever metastasis goes also that time also the spleen enlarges so now we'll come to the non specific acute splenitis so here uh, 
here uh, it is not specific but, but there is the uh, inflammation of the spleen is there but it is not very specific so it can be caused because of the various reasons so that's why here it is the name is the non specific acute splenitis is there so here the enlargement of the spleen is there and th that is mainly because of the blood bond infection so the blood bond infections can be any bacteria isn't it so so here the, there will be the non specific reactions which are caused by the microbial agents and then the cytokines released by the as a immune response so there will be the enlargement of the spleen will be there because of the blood bond infections in case of the non specific acute splenitis and so these organisms can be the any bacteria or other this uh, blood bond infections isn't it it's like malaria and all and also the cytokines released by the immune response will also lead to the because of this microbial agents uh, or because of the body immune system the cytokines will be released and then the spleen also gets enlarged so now we'll come to the morphology so here in case of the acute splenitis non specific acute splenitis spleen is enlarged up to 200 to 400 grams so it is not much enlarged isn't it so 200 to 400 grams is uh, it has become weight and then it is soft in consistency so uh, the spleen weight was how much i told you 140 g isn't it so so now here the spleen has become 200 to 400 g and now the spleen has enlarged and it is soft is soft in consistency so microscopically we will see the acute congestion of the red pulp so in the spleen there are red pulp and then the white pulps are there so in case of the acute splenitis we will see the congestion of the red pulp and then because there is the congestion of the red pulp that's why the lymphoid follicles or the white pulp will be effaced so more and more red pulp it, if it is seen then there will be the slightly effacement of the white pulps or the lymphoid follicles will be there so we can see the neutrophils plasma cells and then sometime eosinophils will be there in the red and then the white pulp understood here so on the microscopically mainly we will see the red pulp but the lymphoid follicles or the white pulp will be uh, effaced and on the microscopy we can see also these neutrophils plasma cells and then the occasionally eosinophils will also be there and sometimes we can see the acute necrosis at the center of the splenic follicles so usually when we will see the necrosis then we can suspect the hemolytic streptococcal infection so it is a bacterial infection so here whenever uh, hemolytic streptococcal infection is there then the spleen is removed then we will see the acute necrosis and rarely the abscess formation will be there in the spleen so now we'll come to the congestive splenomegaly so here congestive splenomegaly means the splenomegaly is there because of the mainly the congestion so chronic venous congestion can cause a form of the splenic enlargement referred to as a congestive splenomegaly so here now you see uh because of the venous congestion i told you in case of the right sided heart failure or in case of the cirrhosis there will be the venous congestion in the spleen isn't it so because the blood flow will not be proper that's why here the splenic enlargement will be there and finally leading to the congestive splenomegaly so it may be because of the systemic causes so there may be the intrahepatic disorder and so here whenever there is intrahepatic disorder means within the um, liver uh, whenever some disorder is there like the there will be the retra portal venous drainage will be there or the portal venous drainage is not properly drained then it will lead to the chronic venous congestion finally leading to the splenomegaly now in case of the extra hepatic cause so now the portal vein or the splenic vein it will be directly obstructed finally leading to the splenomegaly understood here so chronic venous congestion can form a splenic enlargement referred to as congestive splenomegaly so it may be the systemic cause now here that is intrahepatic disorder so intrahepatic disorder means now whenever the Uh, that is the retard portal venous drainage means so whenever the portal venous uh, portal vein drainage 
cannot be properly because of any reason, then it will lead to the chronic venous congestion leading to the splenomegaly. And in case of the extra hepatic cause, it directly obstructs the portal or the splenic vein. So there may be the tumor or there may be the fibrosis or there may be any cause. So it will lead to the obstruction in the splenic vein. And then finally, it will lead to the chronic venous congestion and splenomegaly. So now we'll come to the central nervous system, systemic or the central venous uh, congestion. So here that is the cardiac decompensation. So in case of the cardiac decompensation means, so whenever there is the tricuspid regurgitation is there or the pulmonary valvular disease is there or core pulmonial is there or the left-sided heart failure will be there. What happens here is the heart cannot pump the blood and there will be no proper circulation, isn't it so? So in all these cases, what happens, whatever the blood, it goes from the inferior vena cava to the heart because heart cannot pump the blood. So it will remain in the liver and then there will be the liver congestion will also be there. And then finally, it will lead to the splenic congestion also. Systemic or the central venous congestion means the one example is the cardiac decompensation. So cardiac decompensation. So in case of the tricuspid regurgitation, pulmonary valvular diseases, core pulmonary and left sided of the heart failure. So we'll come all these detail in case of the CVS. So in these cases also, blood cannot be drained to the heart because heart is not pumping properly. So it will lead to the uh, hepatic congestion, finally leading to the splenic congestion, leading to the splenomegaly. So now coming to the morphology. So there is the long standing congestion is there. And then here, whenever there is the long standing congestion will be there, there will be the massive splenomegaly will be there. So it will lead to the enlargement of the kidney up to one kg or the thousand gram or more. So spleen where it is 140 gram, now it has become enlarged up to thousand gram or one kg. And now in case of the acute splenitis, it was soft in consistency but now here it is long standing and then there may be the fibrosis so it will be form in consistency and the splenic capsule it will be thickened so whatever covering of the splenic capsule is there it is uh, going for a long duration of time that's why the capsule is thickened and it is fibrous and cut surface will show the meaty appearance somewhat like meat appearance so meaty appearance will be there and it may be gray red to the deep red depending upon the fibrosis. So if it is more fibrosis, it will look like the gray red. And if it is less fibrosis, it will look like deep red. And now here, the white pulp is indistinct. So now here, the mainly the red pulp will be, um, because it is uh, related with the congestion, isn't it? So, so the white pulp will be indistinct. So we'll go to the morphology once again long-standing congestion, massive splenomegaly. Here the weight of the spleen will be more than 1,000 gram or up to 1,000 gram or 1 kg. It is form in consistency. Capsule is thickened and fibrous. For surface, it will look the meaty appearance. Some meat-like looking will be there. And it depends upon the fibrosis, how much fibrosis is there. If more fibrosis, it will look the grayish in color, gray red. And if it is less fibrosis, it will look the deep red depending upon the fibrosis. And here the white pulp is indistinct. So uh, now you, I started the class very uh, late, isn't it? So, so um, can I take your fi uh, five, six minutes? If you uh, agree, then I'll be taking your classes. Can you raise hands? Because spleen is not much. Okay, only two people raising. You don't want me to take class. Okay, spleen is not only... Now I must have finished much classes, but I'll... Okay, okay, thank you. Now... Mm, now I told you about the gross disease, isn't it so? So now here microscopically red pulp is congested in early chronic congestion, but it becomes more fibrous and cellular with time. Means because of the fibrosis, it becomes cellular with time. But in the early cases or in the early time, we will see the red pulp it will be seen. It uh, More and more red pulp will be seen and the spleen look on, look congest will look congested. But later on, whenever it will show the fibrosis and whenever... Uh, in case of the long standing cases, it will be cellular with time. So there will be the deposition of the collagen in the basement membrane of the sinusoidal spaces. In the uh, 
spleen, the sinusoidal spaces will be there as in case of the uh, lymph node. So there will be the deposition of the collagen in the basement membrane of the sinusoids. So basement membrane will show the collagen and we can see the foci of recent and old hemorrhage. So the uh, splenic congestion is going on for the long duration of time, isn't it? So, so that's why here we will see the old hemorrhage also and then we will see the recent hemorrhage also. So here organization of the focal hemorrhage, it gives rise mm. to the uh, nodules that is known as the Gandhi gamma nodules. And so it will show the foci of the fibrosis together with the this uh, calcium and then the iron salt deposition will be there in the connective tissues together with the elastic fiber. So whenever we, in case of the long standing splenic congestion, whenever it is going on uh, for a long duration of time, we can see the hemorrhage, old hemorrhage also, and then we will see the fibrosis also. And so whenever there will be the collection of fibrosis together with this iron and then the calcium salt, we can see the, uh, some fibrostic area will be there with the calcium salt and then the iron salt deposition together with the tissues. That uh, area is known as the gamma Gandhi nodules or the gamma Gandhi bodies or the Gandhi gamma nodules. So it is the same thing. So here the iron deposition is there. So whenever we will do the uh, iron stain or the pearls Prussian blue, then we will see the bluish bluish deposition of the iron. Understood here? So I'll describe once again this one. Red pulp is congested in early chronic congestion, but it becomes more fibrous with the cellular, more fibrous and cellular with time. And there is deposition of the collagen in the basement membrane of the sinusoids. And we can see both old and then the recent hemorrhage. And then this hemorrhage together with the collagen is known as the Gandhi gamma nodules. And then so this Gandhi, Gandhi gamma nodules will show the iron and then the calcium salt deposition. Uh, so usually whenever the splenic question comes, then this may be asked, what do you mean by uh, gamma Gandhi nodules or what do you mean by gamma, uh, this one, Gandhi gamma nodules that may be asked and then what is deposited, uh, how it is formed, then that time you have to say that, okay, uh, it is because of the fibrosis together with the iron and then the calcium salt deposition and somebody may even ask the question like, what uh, stain will you do? Then since there is the hemorrhage, isn't it? So blood will have the RBC, RBCs will have the iron. So that's why whenever we will do the special stain with the this pearls Prussian blue, then with the iron, if you cannot say the pearls Prussian blue, you can see the iron stain, we can see the bluish bluish deposition of the this iron. So now your class is finishing. So only pictures are there. So now here it is the spleen. And now here this is the accessory spleen. So this uh, is not necessary here, but still uh, here I'm showing you. So spleen is there and with a thin, uh, this vessel, one spleen, something like baby spleen is attached, isn't it? So, so it's a accessory spleen. So now here you see here, this is the um, spleen is enlarged, splenomegaly is there and half of the part in the lower side on the left, you can see there is the fibrosis or the thickened fibrous capsule is there, isn't it? So, but it is still reddish in color. And now you see the cut surface, it looks like meaty color, isn't it so? And some periphery, the fibrous uh, capsule you can see towards the right side and the left side. So it is showing the meaty appearance. Cut surface is the very uh, brownish in color like meat. And now here, this is a picture of the spleen, which is showing the splenic infarct. So it is important splenic infarct. You must have, uh, uh, you'll see in case of your practical, so Splenic infarct is there, so the splenic infarct will show the triangular-like area, isn't it so? So the apex will be toward the, the obstructed vessel and then the base will be towards the periphery, isn't it so? So now you see here this picture, I want in this picture I want to show you the thick capsule. So now it is going on for the long duration of time, that splenic congestion is going on for the long duration of time. And the cut surface is not meaty. The previous one, it was very meaty. It was reddish. But now here it is looking the grayish in color because it is showing the fibrosis. So here you can see small, small within at the center. You can see the some uh, this uh, splenic sinusoidal spaces are there. So it is showing the fibrosis. And uh, on the left, sorry, on the right side, you can see the thick capsule of the spleen. 
so this is a picture of the uh, this uh, storage disorder so this is showing the macrophages macrophages eating up the in case of the uh, storage disorder there will be the uh, two types isn't it so so one i told nimen pick disease and another one is a gaucher's disease so it is showing the foamy foamy macrophages okay your class is finished did you understand uh can you just write somebody uh, uh, what um, did arnab sir yesterday and uh, i mean uh, uploaded the slide did he upload any slide yesterday okay yesterday that burkitt lymphoma was uploaded no no okay so yesterday's that burkitt lymphoma uh, and then together with the um, today's who classification i i will upload the slide and then also the spleen also i will upload the slide is that okay for you okay uh, anything you want to ask your this leukemia lymphoma and then the spleen lymphadenitis everything is finished so uh, from friday maybe i'll be starting with the transfusion medicine so i'll upload the two slides okay to uh, this one presentations okay thank you